articulations. Now, we should be a little familiar with some of the bones. We didn't go through all of them in lab. So, so when we come back, we'll, we'll be really comfortable with the appendicular skeleton because we only did the axial, which, ha which has enough to give you the articulation. So some things should sound familiar. So joints and articulations mean the same thing. And it's where a bone comes together with another bone supported by ligaments and moved by muscles. So like if this is the humerus going into that glenoid cavity of the scapula right here, it's an articulation. And you know about the articular cartilage. I saw your, your um, practicals and really you guys did very well with telling me where hyaline cartilage was <clears throat> for the most part. So that's really good. So that's really a big part of our joints, especially synovial joints, which are the most movable. But let's go through all the classifications, get them down, and, and we'll get that over with, with a, a smaller exam. Right, so understanding the movement, the nature of the joints is what they're made of. And you already know that ligaments connect bone to bone. So ligaments are going to be a big part of it, and depending on which joint and which classification and, and function. So basically, you have to know two things about the, the joints in this PowerPoint. You have to know classifications. One is structural, like anatomical, and the functional classifications. And that'll help you. And we're mostly going to talk about synovial joints later, which are the most mobile. Most mobile, the most ranges of motion. We'll go through the motions today too. So here's some basic structural uh, classifications of articulations, also known as joints. So fibrous has a lot of fibrous tissue or fiber cartilage, and some have a lot of cartilage. And then the synovial joints are the key ones. These are the most mobile synovial and then based on what's inside of them. So the next PowerPoint we'll learn about all the parts of synovial joints because these other joints are, are basically straightforward. We already met the sutures, remember the sutures in lab. So <clears throat> immovable joints functionally are classified as sin arthrosis. Hard to remember this, it's just sin means it doesn't move very much in some other language in Latin. So these are immovable, immovable joints. Like, like the sutures. Then you have the amphiarthrosis, which are slightly movable joints, like maybe the pubic symphysis. And then you have diarthrosis, and these this is where your synovial joints is. So of course I'm gonna ask a lot about synovial joints. So your structural classification of synovial falls under diarthrosis. So they have at least two motions. And with the shoulder, the hip, they have a lot of movement, multi-axial. So they move in different axes. Whereas the knee and the elbow are still synovial joints, but they just don't have as many ranges of motion, which you, which you know. But let's go through what these look like and <clears throat> generally the classifications. So your fibrous joints, generally that avascular, dense, regular connective tissue right, it holds together the ends of bones, and there's no joint cavity. So synovial joints are going to have a nice joint cavity. So structural categories within fibrous are your syndesmosis, the ones, again, don't move, a suture, right, and a gomphosis. Gomphosis, gomphosis is the teeth, or the tooth joint, teeth joint. Suture, we met some sutures, right, we saw the skull sutures, the coronal suture, the sagittal suture, the lambdoid suture, the squamous suture. And then we'll talk about syndesmosis, which is kind of between the radius and the ulna. So there's synarthrosis, which would be like your sutures, and your amphiarthrosis, which is slightly movable. And then cartilaginous joints, they have some movement. They're, they're in slightly movable called amphiarthrosis or they're immobile synarthrosis. So get these terms are synonymous. Synarthrosis is immobile. Amphiarthrosis is slightly movable and diarthrosis is freely movable. So this is a pad of cartilage like your symphysis, your pubic symphysis or 
your intervertebral discs fall into this category, your meniscus of your knee, and then synchondrosis, which I'll show you some examples. And synovial, of course, are the most movable. These are the ones we're going to know the most. And we're going to stick with ball and socket, shoulder and hip, and hinge joint, like your knee and your elbow. And the rest of them will kind of fill in, but the hinge and the ball and socket are the most important that we're going to talk about. So this is articular cartilage at the end of the, the bones, um, at the epiphysis, both proximal and distal. There's space in the joint, so that's called a joint cavity, and that separates the two bones. So there's going to be fluid inside of that, and that's called synovial fluid, and also an articular capsule. So these are the points to know about synovial joints, and we'll go through the synovial joints later. So fibrous joints, again, just to repeat, sutures, syndesmosis, and gomphosis, and gomphosis is the teeth sockets that go into the maxilla and the mandible, right? Do you remember the alveolar process and the alveolar margin? Gomphosis is the joint between the teeth and the maxilla and mandible. And most of these, especially these, are immovable in the teeth, of course, not very movable. Fibrous joints, structural classification. Sutures, like we know, interlocking the joints of the skull. So let's remember some of those we have. A coronal suture, one straight across the top, like a crown. Sagittal suture goes straight down the middle, separating the two parietal bones. And then posterior, you have the lambdoid suture, separating the parietal bones from the occipital bone. And on the side above the temporal bone, you have the squamous suture on both sides. Yes. So of course they, they fuse, the sutures ossify. Um, again, as in, the fetal skull, though, I don't know why I'm saying middle age, but the fetal skull, they're not fused, as you saw in lab. So they'll be on the practical or quiz, you'll see the fetal skull. So should, you should remember that those areas of non-fusion are called fontanelles. So again, go through your um, your departmental lab guide for a word bank. So make sure you can identify all the structures and do really well. <clears throat> Example of a suture, here you go. Wait, Professor, I have a question. Sure, what's up? I cut out a little bit earlier. So you're saying um, fontanelles, I'm pronouncing it wrong, you just said it. Uh, fontanelles, that, yeah. yeah. That's not, that means the fetal skull is not uh, fused, correct? Yeah, like 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 on the side here, like this is, in the, the, the only one you need to know in, in lab is the anterior and posterior fontanelle. So the, these actual bones are not fused, so the sutures are open. So let me see if I can draw this for you. Like you have a, a frontal bone, which is actually two parts on the front. And then the back is also like two bones, posterior and occipital. And then you don't have like that straight through sagittal suture. You have like part of the coronal part of the coronal here, and then there's a fontanelle on the front where they never fuse. So you could actually palpate the blood pulsing and same thing in the back, like the lambdoid suture is not completely fused there. And, and you have another fontanelle, which is the posterior fontanelle. So this would be anterior <clears throat> where you have the frontal bones. Now in an adult, we have one frontal bone. So those bones completely fuse without a suture before you're born. So the ones you see the most are the anterior fontanelle and the posterior fontanelle. Like the soft spot, they call that like in babies, where it's really sensitive because really your brain tissue is exposed. It's not, it's not only the blood flow, it's your brain tissue is actually exposed to the outside world. <clears throat> Make sense? Yes, thank you. Syndes, you're welcome. Syndesmosis is bands of um, fibrous connective tissue connecting um, two bones together. Of course, there's gonna be the ligaments. It's like a band, like a, like almost like a wrapping, a wrapping around there. So there's a slight movement, like the tibiofibular joint. Like those two bones don't move around each other. The, uh, the radius and the ulna have a little more movement, of course, because the radius has to radiate as you, you open up your palm to supinate and 
turn your palm down to, to pronate. So between the two bones, you have this interosseous membrane between the radius and ulna. So again, you, you, if, you, if you do something, let's say you have a job and, you, and you're constantly twisting your arm, you know, like they, they call it like tennis elbow sometimes when the, one of the muscles gets inflamed, the tendons. But if, if you're always moving that through that area of movement, you wind up injuring it, like overuse um, conditions, musculoskeletal conditions happen from usually very easily in these areas of overuse. So the membrane can get inflamed, the membrane could be injured. So between these bones are a good example, like the radius and ulna is that interosseous membrane. Let's see if we get a good picture. So this is basically the joint between the tibia. This is the tibia, distal tibia. And this is the distal fibula. And they, they're connected by joints, but they're not very movable, really hardly at all. And there's, a lot of, there's not a lot of give either. So if you get, you know, if you twist, especially a kid, young athlete playing soccer or something, sometimes it's easy to get one of those spiral fractures that you saw in the last uh, lecture. So these are called syndesmosis, usually ligamentous, and sometimes an interosseous membrane like we saw between the radius and the ulna. Gomphosis, I really don't ask a lot about gomphosis, but it's like the, the tooth is the peg and the socket is the um, under the alveolar margin of the mandible or the maxilla. So maxilla is above the mouth and mandible is below the mouth. And there's ligaments. So if you're interested in dentistry, here's, you, here's where you go. Myself, I'm not that interested right now. I'd rather talk about the other joints. But gomphosis has to do with the teeth, if you're asked on that exam. And there's a good example showing the peg and socket. And there's a ligament which holds the bones together, periodontal. Makes sense. <clears throat> so I'm not going to ask you about peg and socket. Just know gomphosis has to do with the, the teeth going into the, the jaw or the maxilla, so mandible or maxilla. So cartilaginous, again, not highly movable, but more movable, obviously, than a, a suture for sure. So synchondrosis, which is very slightly movable, and symphysis, which is not much more movable, like the pubic symphysis. And that you have to know for the, the lab too, you have to know where the pubic symphysis is and, and know that it's, it's a fibrous joint. So here's synchondrosis. So here's the, here's the key here. Remember, the prefix for cartilage is chondro. So you know you're talking about cartilage here. So highline cartilage, especially. So they're immovable. Um, <clears throat> remember the cartilage um, uh, around the sternum, which is highline cartilage, can be considered synchondrosis, especially at the top cartilage between the first rib and the manubrium of sternum. But the costal cartilage, right? The costal cartilage, which you have to name for lab. Okay, more cartilaginous joints. This shows that. Um, cartilage between the first rib and the sternum. Remember, this is the clavicular notch right here of the sternum, of the manubrium, right? This is the manubrium, is that tie knot. And this is the jugular notch up here. And this is the first rib coming off the first thoracic vertebra, T1. And here's some articular cartilage, which you know very well. And sometimes in somebody who's not fully grown, you have that hyaline cartilage epiphyseal plate, which is really important on the the next exam, right? Talking about growth plates, epiphyseal plates versus epiphyseal line. So when we look at the bones after a spring recess, the, the appendicular skeleton, you'll see that there's no plate. You're looking at fully grown muscles where it's just an, an epiphyseal line. So epiphyseal plate is present in somebody who's still growing and epiphyseal line in somebody who is completely grown, interstitial growth, right? In length of those bones, distal and proximal. So remember all the centers for ossification and endochondral ossification. So symphysis is fibrocartilage, which you told me on the lab practical very well. And there's also hyaline cartilage present, but most of it is fibrocartilage. So examples of symphysis are both intervertebral joints and the pubic symphysis. So the intervertebral discs, really, that should say, 
the IVDs. So I'll ask you that on the practical too. You'll have to look at the side and make sure you know the difference of what's a bone and what's a disc. Like in the lumbar spine, you have the vertebral body anterior, and then you have the spinous process posterior. And then there's another lumbar vertebrae, should line up a little better than that. <clears throat> and then another, and total of five. Right? And in between them, you have this intervertebral disc, which is made of fibrocartilage mostly. It's a little herniated disc there. So this is the IVD, which is fibrocartilage, and it's also known as a symphysis, fibrous joint. Here it is. Not as good as my drawing, of course. Excuse me, Professor. Yes. Just to clarify, IVD is hyaline cartilage? No, it's fibrocartilage. Yeah, the IVD is intervertebral disc. Okay. So like right here, this is where it's spelled out for you, Ryan. And it's fibrocartilage. But there is some hyaline cartilage there. But if I ask you, I'm, I'm looking more for fibrocartilage. Of course, you'd be right if you said hyaline, but it's mostly fibrocartilage. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because, again, it's not really telling you here. But a, a disc, an inter intervertebral disc has two parts. It has, and the true disc, you know, like, like, did you ever hear the term herniated disc? Yeah. So the, the disc in the middle, like this part, is what herniates. If you get a little bubble in the outside fibers, like, a, which is highlight cartilage, it's not totally highlight cartilage anyway, that would just be a disc bulge. But if this moves, this disc in here, that's herniation and that could and, and nerves come out from these intervertebral foramen so if it puts pressure the disc itself not just the outer cartilage the disc so truly the IV, the ivd the intervertebral disc is fibrocartilage and that's what herniates that's what causes compression of nerve roots in those areas scary stuff man so synovial joints so let me, we have a whole other PowerPoint going into each one and we'll go through the main parts of that. <clears throat> so first thing, there's not the first thing, but one of the things is you have a joint cavity, which is fluid in it. So you have the fluid is called synovial fluid. Specialized cells called synoviocytes will produce and secrete that synovial fluid for, to, to reduce friction and keep the joint moving freely between the two bones, especially in the shoulder and the hip, but also the knee and the ankle and the elbow. So all limb, all appendicular joints are synovial because that's where the most movement is. So they have bursae. Now bursa, like if I heard of bursitis, is a, a fluid-filled sac that's within the synovial joint, especially the shoulder and the hip that secrete a little thicker fluid. That's a little bit different than synovial fluid because it's a little thicker, more viscous, which means it's, it's a little bit thicker and maybe a little bit oilier, so to speak. And sheaths, tendon sheaths, kind of wrap tendons together because it like, like picture how many tendons, how many muscles are in your, um, even in your wrist, like all those tendons that flow from your forearm to your fingers and your hand so there's a lot of tendon sheaths around there. And then in your shoulder, you have the rotator cuff, which is made up of four muscles, and then the deltoid is on top of it. So all those four muscles of the rotator cuff have very narrow tendons, and they're kind of wrapped in sheaths. It's like a napkin ring. Do you ever see that? When you have a napkin, and they, they put it on a table with a ring around it, the ring is like the sheath that you slide the napkin through. <clears throat> so that acts as kind of a guide. Also very prone to injury especially with overuse injury, and it's an overuse joint. So they have stability and you'll see the factors involved in stability and ligaments, of course, and muscle tenderness uh, connections are really important. And sometimes you have a disc, like an, uh, a symphysis, like a meniscus. So many types of movements or many different planes of movements <clears throat> and the joints are uh, classified into some more types. So this is the one we spend most of the time talking about. So six general features, the first three, articular cartilage, which you know, that's hyaline cartilage that's on the end of the bones, epiphysis, proximal distal, if you're talking about those long bones, 
and it, it, it allows for movement, but I think that's more important than preventing crushing of the ends of bones, but it protects the bones. It protects the bones. It's like a shiny bluish, very smooth uh, cartilage on the ends of bones. So there's very little friction. So if there was no cartilage, which happens in something like osteoarthritis where the articular cartilage wears out, then you have a space in the joint called the a joint cavity. In this case, it's synovial joint. So we call it a synovial joint capsule. That's fluid spill filled. And you want to keep, you want to maintain that space. Because sometimes that space gets closer together, which is another sign of osteoarthritis, which is wear and tear of the synovial joints, basically. And then there's a capsule, which has a fibrous layer, which is outer, and then a synovial membrane, which has the cells that produce the fluid. So the capsule in a, in a synovial joint, it's kind of taking an ACE bandage of fibrous tissue lined by synovial membrane and wrapping it, wrapping the joint. It's almost like an ACE bandage a joint, the way, the way it's designed actually. So when, when you're hurt on the field or you're hurt, you have an injury, you go to the hospital, sometimes they, they wrap it kind of the same way the articular capsule is configured. So like if you're a, an athletic trainer, you're basically trying to mimic that joint capsule, first of all, to protect it and keep it intact, but, and, and also immobilization as well. So if you're back on the field, you might have a, a taping that allows for some movement and kind of mimics that, that's a joint capsule. So then the fluid, again, it's viscous, the synovial fluid, but of course the bursa is gonna produce even more viscous. So it prevents fr friction by being slippery. And plasma is basically very similar to the plasma in your blood, the liquid portion of your blood. So high hyaluronic acid is basically a building product, a building block of cartilage, high hyaluronic acid, um, which actually builds collagen. That's one of those more microscopic parts of collagen. So that's part of the joint. So lubricating the joint, like kind of oily and keeps the cartilage, you know, with the glucose and the ions it needs because there are cells, there is chondrocytes in there that have to be maintained. And there's also some immune cells like phagocytic cells like macrophages, which is really important. Now, this, is, this is good because if you get injured, macrophages are gonna prevent any um, microbes like bacteria causing infection or viruses causing infection possibly. But sometimes you get too much of this. Like when a joint is worn out or, or getting old or is injured, excess macrophages are produced. Excess synovial fluid is produced. So it's almost like too much fluid on the knee. Like sometimes when you injure a knee or a shoulder even, you get a lot of fluid and the fluid can lead to pain and immobility. Sometimes it's an overreaction of macrophages, an overproduction of synovial fluid or an overproduction of bursal fluid or fluid from the bursa. The bursa is like a little sac around these joints, which you'll see. So different types of ligaments, you have the capsular ligaments, which are part of the capsule and extra means outside of. So extra capsular ligaments and intra is even deeper. So I'm not gonna ask you about these three, but I need you to know that a joint capsule is a big part and the ligaments around the joint are big parts of the synovial joint. And it's, it's innervated and it's vascular. When you hear, when you see nerves, especially sensory nerves, we're talking mostly sensory nerves that pick up pain. So that's why a joint when it's injured has a lot of discomfort. So when there's nerves, it means it's innervated or innervated means there's nerves there, innervated. And blood vessels means it's vascular. Now remember the ligaments themselves are not vascular. I'm talking about the joint overall, the blood supply to the joint because you need, you need blood supply to make the synovial fluid. You need the plasma, right? And you have to get rid of the, the byproducts that are in there. So the, the innervation is more about sensory nerves that detect maybe some inflammation or pain. And then you have these joint position 
receptors or stretch receptors. I'm gonna throw a word at you because we're gonna use this when we get to the nervous system. The ones that monitor joint position and stress, stretch, I'll call, get this word now, is proprio receptors. So these are receptors in your joint that sense stretch, overstretch, sometimes tension, too much tension in the joint, or just sense movement. Like if you're, if you're moving dynamic movements, acceleration, deceleration. So proprioceptors are mechanical receptors in synovial joints that monitor the position of the joint in dynamic moving or, or just, just posture as well in the joint though. And nerves are basically like nerves that detect pain, sensory nerves, they're called noceo or noceo receptors or noceo receptors. So proprio is about joint position and movement or stretch. Noceo is always everywhere, even on your fingertips, is about pain sensation. So, but these are receptors. These are picking up the stimulus or the change in stimulus. And you have a lot of blood capillaries, which kind of exchanging gases, exchanging ions, <laughs> exchanging nutrients. So it's like a, um, a metacarpophalangeal joint. This is not like a shoulder or knee or anything. This is just a synovial joint between the, your fingers and the hand or, or, or the phalanges. So here you have all the parts, the ligament connecting the two bones and it would be on both sides in this particular case. A ligament connects bone to bone, dense, regular connective tissue, not very vascular and not innervated either. So the joint itself is the innervation. Then you have the cavity, which is the, the space within the joint. And then you have synovial fluid, which is flowing in the joint. And here's your articular cartilage, cartilage proximal and distal or the other way around, whatever. We don't know exactly what we're looking at here. <clears throat> and this is an adult bone. So just by the way, this, this has an epiphyseal line. So it's a long bone. And then you have your articular cartilage, which has an outer just below the ligament, you have that fibrous layer. And that's dense, irregular connective tissue, actually, the fibrous layer of the joint capsule. And inside you have epithelial layers or epithelial layer of synovial sites that secrete and make synovial fluid, which fills the joint. And it doesn't show you a bursa here because you don't have a bursa in every joint. You just have them in the really mobile, mobile joints like the hip, the shoulder, and the knee, which are all diarthroses and are all synovial joints. And this is just pointing out the covering of the bone, which is called periosteum, which you should know. So these are kind of um, accessory structures, if you will, of synovial joints, like fatty pads for cushioning between the, um, the layers of joint capsule. And you do see that, and it's, it's a great extra cushioning for a movement, excess movement and lack of wear and tear. And sometimes you have these discs like the menisci, which are still their fibrocartilage as well, just like the intervertebral discs and the pubic symphysis. And the menisci, the only place you're really gonna see this is in the knee, the medial and lateral meniscus. <clears throat> and there's two, you know, there's one in each, there's two of in each knee, medial and lateral menisci. Good shock absorbers, right? fibrocartilage, thick, strong. And synovial fluid, of course, bags of synovial fluid, lubricating like the synovial sites. And bursae also reduce friction. And because the muscles and tendons all attach to the outside of the capsule. So again, bursae will produce more viscous fluid, even more viscous, and it depends on where it is, but mostly bursae you see in the knee the hip and the shoulder, and then the tendon sheaths. So these are all big parts of the synovial joint. Shoulder now. So this is the shoulder, this is the humerus. And let's see the parts. Um, here's your articular cartilage, joint cavity, um, joint capsule fibrous layer, right? Here's a 
a tendon of the biceps in this case that has a tendon sheath that it kind of rides through because there's other muscles too. It's not just this biceps, brachii, there's other muscles. So right between the two bones, like this is the acromion process of the scapula, you have a bursae. This is probably the biggest bursae in your body, biggest bursa, secreting fluid in between. So it's an accessory to the synovial joint, not necessarily in the synovial joint, although it's very close. Shoulder joint. This is a close-up of the bursa. So it definitely helps decrease friction. Now, this is a, a tendon right here, most likely a tendon. Could be a ligament too, but as you're moving your humerus, now your humerus is static. If you move your humerus up into flexion, you're gonna get a lot of friction between the bone and the, the cartilage and a, a ligament or a tendon or another bone. So the bursa kind of reduces that friction and produces fluid. And, and if it becomes too active, it'll start to secrete a lot of fluid and then, and then you get inflammation, which is bursitis that can actually calcify. You can actually get calcification in a bursa, which is extremely painful form of bursitis. Sometimes it causes something called frozen shoulder where you can't even move your shoulder where you need an injection of something like cortisone, right? Into that joint to relieve the inflammation that's caused by excess bursa secretion and then calcification on top of it makes it even harder and more painful bursitis right so things that affect the stability and the stability is is being able to to use those joints the way they're supposed to be without um, injuring them or without losing your balance or losing your strength so three factors that determine this is shape of the articular cartilage of course that should be where it's supposed to be, the ligaments that surround it. So really this, I think, is an important thing in the design of the joint. Because the articular surface is not as important, but the ligament and how many ligaments, like your hip has a lot of ligaments that really support it. So you could probably hang upside down from your knees and you, you really wouldn't injure your hips too much, unless of course you, you're a gymnast through your whole life and constantly trying to dislocate your um, your hips, you know, or not trying, but you know, you, you're constantly causing a complete pull of the hip. So the more ligaments like in the hip is a very stable joint. The shoulder is not. The shoulder has ligaments, but the shoulder is a very prone to injury as you probably know, because there's not so much stability. And of course the muscle tone is important around the joint. And this for stability is the most important. So like if you injure a knee or even a shoulder or a hip, you spend a lot of time in physiotherapy trying to keep that muscle tone correct to really keep your joints strong and prevent injury and get back on your feet or back to the game, whatever you have to do. So once the muscle, muscle strength and the tendons become stronger, then you get more stability in the joint. So again, like we do rehab for shoulder, knee joints, and even ankle, right? And as part of the bottom of your foot, plantar fasciitis and things like that, that are really painful. So this is kind of a breakdown of the joints. Um, and, and it's always good to go through this before you go into a, an exam so you can see everything in front of you, showing the different, the sutures and what type of joint it is, the syno uh, synovial joint, which is a diarthrosis, it's a synovial joint, but it's more of a saddle joint. And then between the vertebrae, you have your symphysis, right, which is fibrocartilage, and, and especially key in on the synovial joints, ball and socket. So the ball, main ball and sockets are the two joints, basically, is the shoulder joint between the humerus and the scapula. And later on, you can't see it on this picture, but the ball and socket between the femur and the oscoxa, which you learned in lab last week and you'll learn tomorrow. So the lower limb, lower appendage, 
see the hip, and that's called a coxal joint. That's where oscoxa comes from, which is diarthritic. And, and the ranges of motion, I'm going to go through these with you. Um, the ranges of motion and what joints are moving. And, and maybe by the time you get to muscle, you'll know what muscles are moving, what bone when a joint is moving. So again, you didn't learn the appendages yet. In fact, half of you didn't learn the axial skeleton. But there's a lot of points on muscles, I'm sorry, on bones where muscles are going to attach. And there's movements like flexion of the knee, extension of the knee, flexion of the hip, rotation of the hip, circumduction of the hip. Because these are movable joints, these are synovial joints. So it's really important that you go through them. And we'll revisit that too when we do muscles and, and their connections to the bone. So this is about uh, muscles, how uh, muscles move bones. So let's get these down now. Like you know that a tendon attaches uh, a muscle to a bone, but there has to be an origin of that muscle and an insertion of that muscle. So the origin is usually proximal, but it's usually the immobile, the immovable bone. Like if you flex your bicep, when you bring your hand closer to your shoulder, that's flexing your elbow actually. So what's moving is your radius, your lower arm, your forearm. So that's where the insertion is gonna be. And the origin is up in the scapula for the bicep. These are hard to remember. These are, so the insertion is attached to the muscle that's actually moving. Like if you flex your knee, like bring your uh, heel towards your buttocks, that means your hamstrings are contracting to move your lower leg, which is your tibia. So the origin is above the tibia, of course, because the tibia is the insertion that's moving. So the origin could be either up on the ischium bone and the gas coxa or on the femur, depending on which muscle we're asking about. So in a muscle contraction, the insertion moves towards the origin. These are hard, these are hard to learn. And you'll learn the planes of movement when we talk about movements and how they move. And the, and the names of the movements are important too. So range of motion allowed by synovial joints. Multi-axial is the most, is the way I learn it. Multi-axial, because each plane is called an axis. So it depends on what motion, we'll go through the motions. So non-axial, it's just kind of gliding. It's really not moving, you know, it's, it's also going to be called gliding where it really doesn't move very much. It's kind of just barely moving. Uniaxial is only one type of movement. And we're not really that interested in that, but we're interested in the either biaxial, like the knee or the elbow, which are hinge joints, or the multiaxial joints, diarthroses or synovial joints, of course. And that's, um, multiaxial is your shoulder and your hip. So general types of movements, so gliding, again, not that interested in, rotation's a big one, and different angular movements. Like how the, how the bones move really, as opposed to the way the joints are moving, I should say. So these are good examples. And again, you didn't get to the, the hands or the, the toes and feet and ankles and, and wrists, but gliding movements is just one, not a long bone, but a flat bone kind of slips over another surface. It could be a long bone too. So the intercarpal joints or the joints of the wrist or the bones of the wrist are called carpal. So they have slight movements, slight movements. And then you have the tarsals or your ankle bones. So they have slight movement too. And that's just, just gliding, no rotation, no flexion or extension, anything like that. And the, and the vertebral discs, intervertebral discs, hardly move either. They have, they're more pivot points for motion and shock absorbers. So there's not a lot of axis of motion in those. So this is gliding, like really, these bones are barely moving. Like, I don't even know why we have these. There's eight of them in both hands, eight in each hand of carpals. You can learn them all later. So gliding is just, you know, just to move your, this is called um, a deduction. This is a abduction in the anatomical position. So it's not a lot of movement with gliding. 
angular movements is more what we need to talk about, which is flexion, like I did with the biceps brachii and the, the knee with the hamstring. Extension is pretty much the opposite of flexion. And hyperextension is just a little bit above the normal amount of extension. And we'll show you some pictures that are really helpful. These are really helpful. So I think when, when you're learning the origins, insertions, and actions of muscles, and of course you have to know the bone parts, it's always best to understand the, the actions, which are movements. So these are movements come from actions or contractions of muscle. So each muscle has an origin, the immovable part, and an insertion, a movable part. This is not a great example of that because there's so many muscles acting right here. So this is neutral. So if she brings her chin to her chest, that's neck flexion, cervical spine, which you should know if you went to lab last week. And that tomorrow you'll learn more about the cervical vertebrae. So they're flexing to bring the chin to the chest. And then as she brings it back to neutral, that's extension. So extension is going from the chin to the chest to neutral. Hyperextension is going beyond neutral where her head is going towards her back. That's hyperextension of the cervical spine of the neck. And technically you could say of the head. So flexion, extension, hyperextension of the neck or head. We could say that. So now she's moving her her lumbar vertebral column or lumbar vertebrae. So here's neutral. She bends forward, like maybe to touch her toes or bring her head forward. That is lumbar flexion. Then if she goes back to neutral, that's lumbar extension. If she goes beyond neutral, that's hyperextension. So you really have to contract those lumbar muscles that you'll learn a lot about those too. So I think, I think we should go through all of these and just get a good idea of the actions of the, of the joints. You know, the joints are really creating the movement. The bones are moving and the muscles are moving the bones. So this is a really big musculoskeletal uh, takeaway um, that you learn piece by piece. But first you have, to, you have to learn the bones in lab and it makes it a lot easier. So she's doing a couple things here. Now she's flexing her shoulder. She's, her arm is straight, her elbows are extended, but she's flexing her shoulder, which means like, like Frankenstein, you just bring your, your arm straight up in the anterior plane. And here she's flexing her knee. That's knee flexion coming backward. And when she brings it back, it's extension. So her, so technically her, I think this is her left leg, right? No, that's her right leg. It's, this is her left leg is in extension. Her right leg is flexed. Left leg extended, right leg flexed. So extension is bringing the leg forward and that's the quadriceps. Extension, I'm sorry, flexion would be hamstring. And she's doing the same with her shoulder now. So she flexed her shoulder going this way and now she's bringing it back into extension, extending back. Not a, not a lot of range there, much more range in flexion for the shoulder than there is an extension. Crazy. So then more angular motions, abduction, abduction, and adduction, two opposite movements. So AB is away, abduction away from the midline. AD is adding to the middle, adduction towards the midline. Circumduction is like kind of swinging around in a circle, like the hokey pokey, where you're kind of involving, you're flexing your shoulder or your, your leg or your hip, femur or humerus. You can pull it away from the body or extend it. And then adduction all at the same time because you're rotating it in circles. Limb a cone in space, well, cool. So this is kind of rolling like her shoulder around. The, the movement is here, not in the hand. The hand is uh, still. It's not moving. It's not flexing or extending. So the circumduction is coming from the shoulder. So this is circumduction down 
with her left arm. That's called circumduction. She, you could do that with your hip too. You can circumduct your hip. You just got to adduct it a little bit and move it in a circle. And that would be circumduction. Now, if she brings her arm towards the midline, it's adduction, a deduction. If she moves her arm away from her midline, it's a abduction. And the same thing with the legs. If she moves her legs straight across this way, it would be a abduction, abduction. We use the tensor fascia lata. If she moves her legs toward the midline or leg towards the midline using the adductors, like the gracilis, the adductor magnus, or the adductor longus. So again, it, it, once you learn the bones, then you learn the bone markings. And in the between, you learn the movements of those joints. And that'll help you with origins insertions. So learn the actions first, which is what we're doing now. Rotation, different rotational things like rotating your head straight right to left is like saying no, no man, no way. Right, that's the head. And then you have rotation medial and lateral, the shoulder and hip. And there's rotation. Remember, again, you didn't have lab yet, but the atlas is also known as C1 or C1. First cervical vertebrae is known as C1, but we call it the atlas. Atlas, because that means on the top, topmost. C2 is called the axis because it's an axis of rotation of the atlas. So the atlas kind of rotates around the axis, which is C2 below it. And there's a process called on the anterior superior part of the axis called the, the dens or the odontoid process, which I showed you in lab. If you watch the video, you get a, you get a look at it because that's what the practical will be about. Just naming the odontoid process of axis, which is C2. And no, this is a really two really irregular vertebrae especially the atlas is very irregular. Can't call it a long bone, can't call it a flat bone, can't call it a short bone, so we just call it an irregular bone. And this is where structure mirrors function or anatomy mirrors physiology because it's made to rotate around the axis and the axis is made to be a pivot point of rotation for the atlas to say no. So it's really important. So this is cervical rotation or neck rotation or head rotation. So there's right rotation and there's left rotation. Remember, she owns the anatomy. Like I noticed on some of the um, questions on the practical that you, you know, you, you're pointing to like, you know, the, the, the left upper quadrant and you called it right because it's your right, but it's her, she owns the anatomy. So that's left upper quadrant. And you can rotate your your shoulder this way, just like the hip, like if your toes get pointed out in a single plane, that's external rotation of the hip. Or you could say external rotation of the femur, whatever you like, but it's really hip. And then when you bring it back, it's internal rotation. Same thing with the shoulder, but you'd have to move the shoulder. So that's a little more complicated than supination and pronation, which is really about the palms. So remember in the anatomical position, which you know, the palms are supinated. When you turn your palms downward on the table, that's pronating them. So if you're laying face up, it's called supine. If you're laying face down, you're laying prone. So supination and pronation of the hand has a lot to do with supination and pronation of the lower arm bones, the radius and the ulna. So getting some good names here at least. And they're parallel in the anatomical position, especially in the supinated, but then they twist, like the radius kind of twists over the ulna. And that's what it's made to do. That's why it's called radius. because it radiates kind of around the ulna, which is fixed. So the radius is movable with that syndesmosis, right? That interosseous membrane, slightly movable. And the ulna is a fixed bone. It's bigger. Ulna is definitely bigger. It's more medial in the anatomical position when you're supinated, which is anatomical position. You definitely know what that is now. One of the first things you learned in anatomy lab, I think, the anatomical position. This is important. This is what a lot of students forget. I went over this with you in lab uh, the first week. 
So the difference between dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. So dorsiflexion is bringing your toes up towards your shin, towards your tibia. Plantar flexion is pointing your toes downward, like pressing on a gas pedal. Because there's going to be different muscles that perform these movements, origin insertions, and the action. So your calf muscles like gastrocnemius and soleus and Achilles tendon are more about plantar flexion, pointing the toes down, standing on your toes. Dorsiflexion is the opposite, using a muscle called the tibialis anterior, bringing your toes up anteriorly to your shin. Here's pronation and supination. You can see in the supine, in a supinated palm, anatomical position, that these two bones don't cross each other. But now the radius kind of has to roll over the ulna. Because the radius, if and you should remember this, the radius is always on the thumb side in the anatomical position. Radius, thumb side. So this is, remember you told me it's the pollux, is on the same side as the radius in the anatomical position. And look, you turned your thumb this way, so the radius followed it, because it's got a joint, synovial joint, not a major axial movement, but synovial joint. So dorsiflexion, tibialis anterior, bringing your toes up towards your tibia. Plantar flexion, pointing your toes downward, using the gastrocnemius and soleus which are connected to the calcaneus, which is your heel, via the Achilles tendon. It's a tendon of the gastrocnemius and the soleus. They share that tendon, also known as the calcaneal tendon. Dense, regular connective tissue. So this is active in plantar flexion. The Achilles tendon. <clears throat> These are movements we don't talk about a lot. Inversion and eversion of the foot. So inversion, the bottom of your foot, the sole of your foot faces medial, medially. So this is probably the more um, common, like an ankle roll injury. It's easy to roll out your ankle. And I think it's because we have really weak ligaments that stabilize the ankle, especially laterally. So you wind up rolling your ankle where your sole of your foot faces medially towards the midline. And eversion would be harder to do. That would be more, you know, if you're wearing really long cleats on a field and they get stuck and you kind of get hit and your palms, your palms, your soles of your feet go laterally, which is really going to not, it has a strong ligament, but it's it's more likely to break a bone. So inversion injuries, more likely to sprain the ankle. Sprain is um, a problem with the synovial joint. When you have an injury to the ligaments, the joint capsule, the bursa, and that's called a sprain, which leads to a sprain. Right? So sometimes this is worse than a fracture, especially if it's of the fibula. Protraction and retraction, um, like when you protract, that usually is going forward. So you're moving your mandible out towards the anterior, like jutting it out. Maybe there'll be a picture you can see what that looks like. It's hard to describe. And the opposite would be retraction, pulling back towards the body. The scapula can protract and retract too. It's a little more difficult. So protraction and retraction of the mandible. So here's inversion where you're rolling your ankle and here's eversion going this way. Sometimes they call eversion pronation too. Sometimes you're born with more of a pronating foot and you go and you get those orthotics put in your shoes or your cleats, your basketball shoes to prevent you from injuring your ankle and hurting your knee and your hip and your back actually. So inversion is more supination called. So it does depend on your mechanical setup too, like how genetically these angles of your joints are set up or just bad luck. So she's jutting her jaw forward and that's protraction coming forward. 
as she as she brings it back, that's retracting it. And the bone is the mandible, so you have to name the bone that's moving. I mean, there is a joint, I mentioned it um, in lab, called the TMJ, which is the temporomandibular joint. So the temporal bone is up here, and the mandible fits into the temporal bone. And it moves, and it, it also can raise, it is involved in elevating the jaw, but we're talking about retraction, protraction, so it gets involved with that as well. Like elevation and, dep and depression of the jaw. Closing the jaw is elevation, opening the jaw is depression. So elevation, of course, going up, depression going downward, so lowering and raising. Opposition is only one place that we're gonna talk about, and that's you're able to take your thumb and touch each one of your fingers. So that's opposing your thumb towards your fifth digit, fourth digit, third digit, second digit. So opposable thumb because it has opposition and there's muscles of the, of the hand that does that. And it's basically just moving the thumb joint, which is a um, metacarpal phalangeal joint of the first digit. Remember the thumb pollux is the first digit of the hand. So depression of the jaw going downward, elevation upward. Here's opposition. And of course you have to imagine going to every one of those fingers. Thumb, opposition of the thumb. So here's some, just some general um, movements, right? Angular movements versus gliding, angular. And it depends on the joint. If they have all of these, like the shoulder and the hip have all of these, those ball and socket joints. Remember the hip and the shoulder are ball and socket joints. Diarthroses, synovial. They can do all of these motions. So I think it's worth it that we went through every one of these in that way. And like the ones we're going to live on most are a hinge and ball and socket. Because they're the most movable synovial joints, right? So these non, not such movable, they're movable, but they're not axial. They're just kind of glide. You know, these are the carpals, the eight carpals. I'm going to learn those later. Don't know why we have these. I really, I'm still confused on why we need all these carpals and all this. It doesn't really move the wrist anything anymore if it was just one bone. Evolution, my friends. Hinge joint, like this is the elbow joint between the ulna and the humerus, the distal ulna and the proximal, I'm sorry, distal humerus and proximal ulna. You can see the articular cartilage. So this is a hinge joint. You don't have to know the cylinder and the trough. Right? So it's it's only one movement, though. It's uniaxial. But, but you'd have flexion and extension within that axis of movement, flexion and extension of the elbow. And the knee is going to be the same thing, except the opposite direction. This is a pivot joint between the proximal ulna and radius, a pivot joint, uniaxial, because the radius does have to move across the ulna in pronation. Right? That's a pivot pivot joint, but we really want to know the ball and socket and the hinge joint. So you have joints between, here's the carpals. So you have the carpal, metacarpal joints. These are the metacarpal, sorry. Metacarpals are here. One, two, three, four, five names in that order. And then you have phalanges. And these are condylar joints, biaxial, right? Biaxial between the metacarpals and phalanges. And you get a little abduction here. You got flexion extension like of your fingers, but you also get a little abduction. Like you could look at your hand and like kind of splay your fingers outwards and bring them back. So you could abduct your fingers from each other and then adduct the fingers back towards the midline of the hand in that case. And they're synovial joints and they're biaxial. So there's two movements there. So your hands are pretty you know, dexterous, right? You get to move your hands a little bit more. Saddle joint is only one place, right? Is between the thumb, uh, carpal of the thumb and the metacarpal. So it has two movements. It has flexion, extension, and abduction. Abduction. Remember the difference between abduction and adduction. 
ball and socket joint. These are the hip and the shoulder. So this is showing you the shoulder joint again. So you have multi-axial, and this is where we have to live. And all of those ranges of motion are represented in the shoulder. Flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, rotation, and circumduction. Very good. Everybody okay? Any questions about joints? Not the most exciting thing, joints. We're going to get the muscles hopefully tonight. But you need to know this. You need to know. So this PowerPoint is, is specifically for the synovial joints. And, and this is a good way just to introduce you to some bones and bone markings that you might not be 100% familiar with. So here's the five main synovial joints. At least that narrows it down a little bit. We can stay to the big motions. So I mentioned the jaw between the temporal bone and the mandible, and that's the TMJ, the temporal mandibular joint. Shoulder joint, I seem to use the, uh, the most for synovial joints, don't I? Because it's so mobile, it's, it's more than the hip, which is also multi-axial. The elbow and the knee are uniaxial, only flexion and extension. But the shoulder and the hip have all of the ranges of motion. So again, the jaw, I'm not gonna go into too much of specifics of it. You just know it's the TMJ the joint, because you probably just learned that too. And we'll look at the bones in the lab and you'll see the uh, mandibular fossa. You'll see the mandibular condyle. So the mandibular fossa is actually part of the temporal bone. The mandibular condyle is the posterior superior part of the mandible. And there's a ligament in there. So I'm not gonna go too much into each of these uh, pages of temporal mandibular joint. And it works as a, a hinge joint, but it also allows for opening and closing of the jaw and then gliding side to side. Like, here's the problem with um, people who grind their teeth. I might have mentioned this in lab. Um, I don't remember when, maybe, hopefully last week. And when you grind your teeth, you're kind of moving your jaw, very small movements, but a lot of contraction of the muscle. Like, you learn a muscle called the masseter. And grinding of the teeth, there's a word for that, and it's called bruxism. That's grinding of the teeth, and it'll give you pain in your TMJ because it's nerve tissue, it's a synovial joint. And it can be dislocated, so be careful with those big bagels or MMA fighting because it's very easily dislocated joint in the body, which is kind of surprising when you think how easily it is to um, dislocate a shoulder, but we're using our jaw a lot more to talk and we're grinding our teeth. So it is the most easily dislocated, which means that the mandible kind of falls out of the temporal joint, the fossa. Very painful, very difficult to eat your pizza with that going on, for sure, for sure. So again, I'm not gonna go through all of these ligaments, but here's some parts you need to know. You have to remember the external acoustic meatus, which is part of the, the temporal bone. Right. Here's the articular capsule because it's synovial. This is the, what we call the ramus of the mandible. Could be a question on the practical. Right. Don't worry about the ligaments here. And remember the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. Right. Here's the zygomatic bone. Here's the temporal bone. So this is good review. And 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 some people didn't get this yet. If you haven't looked, watched the videos or read ahead, because we're doing that tomorrow, you have enough to worry about. A close up of the TMJ, you can see the condyle, the mandible, and the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone, the two bones, two different bones forming a joint. And you learn the muscles that do depression and elevation of the mandible, or protraction and retraction of the mandible, mostly elevation and depression. So just showing that how these, you know, when you grind your teeth, how it kind of slides to one side. And sometimes you get excessive contraction on one side, it's pretty painful can cause dizziness, can cause headaches. Temporal mandibular joint, you remember that. The shallow socket. Sometimes the, the doctor has to relocate it if it's dislocated. Sounds painful. Sometimes you just wear like a, a mouth guard at night. I don't know if I asked you, nobody seemed to know what this was, but very common where the dentist or orthodontist or TMJ specialist will give you like a mouthpiece that you wear when you're sleeping. So if you grind your teeth, 
um, it'll stop you so much. It'll stop you from grinding so much. So a bite plate is like a mouthpiece. And sometimes they have, it's so bad they have to give you um, like um, muscle relaxers. Yeah, so there's a lot of symptoms like popping of the jaw, pain, stiffness, and sometimes dizziness, massive headaches. This is a good one to remember. This is the glenohumeral joint. So the humerus is your upper arm bone. The gleno means the glenoid cavity of the scapula. So this is one I'm always put on, the glenohumeral joint and the glen, glenoid cavity or glenoid fossa, sometimes it's called as well. So there's a lot of mobility in this ball and socket joint. Like a golf ball and a tee. How about that? I never thought of that. So the articular capsule, all this, the goodies that a synovial joint will have. So here's a, a close up, which we saw already. You see, this is the glenoid cavity of the scapula right here. Little animation of the shoulder. This big green thing, this is a lateral view of the shoulder. Here's the lateral humerus. This is a bursa. So you can see that it looks cool writing on black. So that pre prevents uh, friction between the humerus and the acromion process of the scapula. Here's real anatomy, um, frontal section of the left shoulder. And you see this is the humerus. You can see the white. It's a dead guy, so it's not so blue. This is the articular cartilage. You can see the joint cavity. You might be able to pick up pieces of the joint capsule. There's a, a part of the capsule, sometimes it's called the labrum, which tears very easily with motion. Of course, you're not showing the motion, like watching it, uh, the shoulder move, it moves in all these different directions. So the, there's a lot of vulnerability to injury, wear and tear, inflammation, tendonitis, sprain, dislocation, separation of the shoulder. That can happen in the glenohumeral joint. So the glenohumeral joint, um, let me just go back to that because it's not just the glenohumeral joint. This joint here is really what's prone to dislocation. Like this humeral head will actually kind of slip out of that position and that's dislocation. Like if you're, you fall off a horse onto your shoulder, you're gonna dislocate the humerus out of the ball and socket of the socket, which is the glenoid cavity. So dislocation is common in the shoulder and the hip too, but much more common in the shoulder. I mentioned the labrum, which is really part of the joint capsule. And that could tear as well, because and it doesn't heal very good because it's fibrocartilaginous. And I know a lot of young uh, people who, especially like goalies in hockey, who, who do a lot of wide turns with their hips, you know, falling to, into a split a lot. So even people in their teens getting surgery of a glenoid labrum when they're young, and it heals very well. A little PT, physical therapy, and they're, they're, they're okay. But I'm talking about the hip, right? But this is the glenoid labrum. There's also a labrum in the hip. It's a coxal labrum. But same thing with the shoulder. If you're, um, say, you're a baseball player is really a good example of how you could hurt your glenoid labrum trying to throw curveballs as a teenager, twisting your shoulder to positions that your, real, your shoulder really doesn't want to go. Shoulders is the glenohumeral joint and the whole shoulder joint in general is a really bad architecture, very prone to injury. And the hip is a little bit better, but it also has a labrum, has every, all the same parts. So you have other ligaments and usually the ligaments are named after the bones that they're connecting, like the coracoid process of the scapula and the humerus, which you know, at least you don't know what the coracoid process of the scapula is. You know what the acromial process is, but you don't know what the coracoid process, and they're pretty close to neighboring bone markings on the scapula. Glenohumeral ligaments should sound very familiar because now you know what the glenoid cavity is and you know the humerus. Weak support, this is why. I wouldn't be throwing curveballs unless you're really taught the right way as a young baseball player because it's really gonna strain those ligaments and it's hard to recover that after a while. So here's the main ones, the coracohumeral ligament and the glenohumeral multiple ligaments. So the, they're not always, but most of the time they, they're named 
in one way or another to the ligaments that they attach, like the caracoacromial ligament attaches the coracoid process of the scapula, there it is. And this is anterior to the acromion. So the coracoid process is anterior scapula, the acromion is posterior lateral, right? We met the acromion earlier on, right? That's posterior and lateral, but posterior to the coracoid. So there's a ligament between those two called the caracoacromial. And there's the big green bursa, the tendon sheath, this is the tendon of a muscle that comes out. In this case, it's the biceps brachii. But there are also rotator cuff muscles that insert on the humerus. There's four rotator cuff muscles. It's too much to go into now. This is a lateral view of a synovial joint without the humerus. If I remove the humerus, you could see the glenoid cavity because the humerus will fit right into here. And that would be your arm. So the ligaments, again, named after what's there. Subscapularis happens to be one of the rotator cuff muscles and that has a tendon that rotates. The rotator cuff muscle rotates the humerus, either internally or external rotation or medial or lateral rotation. Not a good architecture. So the rotator cuff are made of four muscles and we'll go over this now. And I like the acronym SITS sits muscles. And if they're correctly used and they're stabilized, they could actually be good protection. But again, we abuse the sits muscles, especially in sports, but even other movements that are repetitive injure the rotator cuff muscles. So you're going to see this called uh, part of the humerus called the intertubercular sulcus because the humerus has two bumps on it uh, called the greater and lesser tubercle, they belong to the humerus. And the tendons are long, like, they're almost like wires. They're, they have a hard consistency. They're dense connective tissue, regular connective tissue. So that they really are hard and they all slip through. So they have a tendon sheath, but they all kind of go through the same area, right through the shoulder joint onto the humerus because the rotator cuff muscles are going to rotate the humerus, medial, and lateral rotation, like when you're throwing a curveball, really. So sits muscles are the supraspinatus, S, the infraspinatus, the teres minor, and the subscapularis. That's how you remember the rotator cuff muscles. So why spinatus, spinatus and scapularis? Because they all have their origins where the muscle starts is on the scapula. So there's a posterior portion of the scapula. It's a really big process, which I'll teach you. And it's called the spine of the scapula. The spine of the scapula is always posterior. So there's fossas, like a supraspinatus, a supraspinous fossa, and that's where the supraspinatus muscle is. And I think the supraspinatus is the most injured rotator cuff muscle. It's on top of the scapula where the infraspinatus muscle is below the spinal scapula, posterior, the subscapularis is anterior scapula and the subscapular fossa, and teres minor is posterior scapula, and there's a teres major too. But according to most of the books, the rotator cuff uh, is comprised of the teres minor, not teres major. But teres major also um, stabilizes the shoulder. Sits muscles, rotator cuff muscles. Real anatomy of a shoulder. And this is really what it looks like, that nice, shiny, smooth looking articular cartilage. So even this dead guy had a pretty good humeral head with articular cartilage, right? And this is the chromium process. They'd have to you know, take a chainsaw and cut that open. And you could see the capsule and some, here's some muscle tissue, right? This is probably um, right here as part of the deltoid muscle, which covers all the rotator cuff. Deltoid muscle is more external or superficial to the rotator cuff. So you have to kind of take, dissect out muscles, you know, um, superficial to deep when you're doing it. So dislocations is a dislocation of the glenohumeral joint. The humerus actually falls out of the glenoid cavity. Like when you go to put your shoulder in to tackle somebody, at least you're not using your helmet or your head but you're risking dislocating your shoulder, the glenohumeral joint. So this is some animations that are on here of each 
of the joint and you can see the muscles that override them. So this is probably pretty cool to look at. You can see they're all connected to the scapula, like the subscapularis. This is the supraspinatus. This is teres minor. And you can't see the infraspinatus because this is an anterior view. Right, you see the costal cartilage, you see the clavicle, the acromial end of the clavicle, and these are your ribs, rib one, two, three, four, five, and they're all true ribs, right? The first seven from top to one through seven are true ribs connected directly to the sternum. So these are really good animations. This is the muscles of the shoulder girdle, they, they call this shoulder, shoulder girdle that move the glenohumeral joint. So the deltoid is very superficial to the rotator cuffs. And this is a pectoralis major muscle and latissimus dorsi here, uh, biceps brachii. These are lumbar muscles in the back. You can see the floating ribs. These are the intervertebral discs right here. And these are the vertebral bodies anterior. Remember the thoracic are the ones with the ribs on. So this is T12, L1. These are transverse processes of the lumbar, so L1. L2, L3, and all the intervertebral discs. And here's the manubrium of the sternum, the body of the sternum, and this is the xiphoid process of the sternum. So just a good little review as we're doing this before we take a break. So lateral view is anterior because I can see the clavicle. And this is the pectoralis major muscle and the deltoid muscle, which is superficial. The deltoid muscle is basically a shoulder abductor, it's a shoulder flexor, and, a sh and partly a shoulder extensor. Actually, the deltoid has three parts, posterior, middle, and anterior, for the major movements. The elbow joint, um, this is pretty much where the humerus proximal articulates with the distal radius and ulna. And in the anatomical position, remember the radius is always lateral thumb side, first digit. And this is a hinge joint, allows for flexion and extension. And it really only three ligaments, the annular ligament, the ulnar collateral ligament, which is gonna be medial because the ulna is medial. And radial collateral ligament is gonna be lateral because the radius in the anatomical position is lateral. So this just shows some movement, the triceps brachii. I know it kind of like went behind. So this is a little strange. This, this one right here is the brachioradialis muscle. So that helps move the elbow. And the biceps brachii is in front, triceps in the back for extension of the elbow, biceps anterior for flexion of the elbow and the brachioradialis. So by the time you get the muscles, you'll have all these down. This is a lateral view of the elbow joint. And you're gonna have to know, know, know the parts of the distal humerus. This is kind of difficult. Uh, a bone marking called the trochlea is part of the humerus. And this is the olecranon process of the ulna. And this is the coronoid process of the ulna. So this is like, if this was the right arm lateral view, his thumb would be like here. Beautiful drawing, isn't it? And you can see the extenders are triceps brachii, the flexors are the biceps brachii. And it's a synovial joint, so you have all the parts. All right, it's not really talking about, it has a bursa. This is called the bar, the barkeep bursa, because they always lean their elbows on the bar. And the bursa sometimes gets huge. It's a real thing. It's a real thing, there's so much fluid in that bursa. There's so much, you know, there's only one movement really, two movements in one plane, flexion and extension of this hinge joint. And now you have the, um, the actual ligaments. So if this, the ulna is here, you have the, oh, where's the ulna collateral? Radial collateral is here, where's the ulna collateral? Can't see it because it's medial, that's why. So here's the annular ligament kind of lays right on front. And here's the joint capsule. This is like they were saying, it's kind of like an ace bandage wrap. Here's your elbow olecranon process of the ulna. And here's your lateral collateral ligament. 
also known as radial collateral ligament. And lateral epicondyle is part of the um, humerus. So this is a cadaver elbow joint. And it's got all the goodies of a synovial joint. You can see the articular capsule. You don't see the articular cartilage in this particular one. There's the annular ligament that comes right across. So there's not a lot of the ligaments. The ulna. So you have the ulnar collateral on the ulna. So you have, remember when you see the ulna, you'll see it. it's no mistaking it because it's got this big olecranon process. It's a lot bigger than the radius. The head of the radius is like a nail head over there. So you'll see that. This is a model which kind of is fair game, completely unfair though. I shouldn't say it's fair game. It's actually unfair. When you see something like this in a practical, just answer whatever it is, because I'll drop that question, don't worry. Something like this is a little different. So you should know the ulna, by the time you go to the practical, you know what an ulna is, you know, and you'll see that the electron process is big. And the, the, I don't know how much joints we're gonna do in lab, so let's get it done now so we don't have to worry about it. We're gonna move on to something else, the muscle sooner. So ulna collateral ligament, this is a cartoon. And this is called the coronoid process, which is the anterior ulna process. The posterior is olecranon. Olecranon. And this is the coronoid process. It's kind of like a wrench, the ulna. It's kind of, you seem pointy like that. Where you, the trochlea of the humerus is like the, the nut or the screw. And this is the wrench part. Animations. Did we miss the hip joint? Right. So the hip joint is another ball and socket, diarthrosis, multi-axial <clears throat> ball and socket. And the socket now is called acetabulum. I'm gonna make a big deal out of that in lab. It has a, a labrum, of course, and this is the one I was mentioning before when we're talking about the glenoid labrum. This is the one that gets injured in somebody who's like a goalie in, in hockey. The way he moves his hips or she moves her hips side to side. I'm doing like half splits and so forth. Cartoon, here's the femur head. This is the ischium here. There's a pubic symphysis and a pubic bone. And you can see all the parts of a synovial joint, articular cartilage. And it doesn't show you all here, but you can see the cavity. You can see the capsule and pretty much it. And there is bursa as well. There is bursa in the hip. Bursitis of the hip, very painful. It's a good picture of um, cadaver. You see how it's nice and smooth that femur head is. And there's a ligament that connects. This is always on a practical. Like this is the acetabulum. This is the femur head. And there's like a little fovea on the femur head. And that's the space for the ligament or ligamentum teres, also known as the ligament of the head of femur. So that's the one, like if you hang upside down, it really gives you support from dislocating your head of femur or your leg falling off completely. And there's the labrum, it's like a lip on top. <clears throat> and you see the um, articular capsule has been cut and dissecting this cadaver. So the same thing, you know, the ilium, the pubic bone, the ischium, connecting the femur. So ligaments connect bone to bone. So if you know the bone, you can name the ligament. And this will be a question, like what, what particular ligament is that? And then you have the ligament in teres, which I just showed you. So good for stability. So it's a deep, and, and this is really important. This is probably why the shoulder isn't, is hurt or injured more than the hip because the ball and socket of the hip has a much deeper socket. It like really fits in well where the, technically the, the shoulder joint is like a ball and spoon, much more prone to injury, especially with overhead movements. You get it. So this makes sense. Um, this is the posterior view. So this is the ischial tuberosity here. This is the, the whole, for Raymond called the ab 
curator for Raymond. Just give you a heads up here. And this is posterior femur, which you'll have to get to know because it's it's very difficult to tell posterior and anterior, but they have trochanters. Like the humerus had tubercles. And here's the ilio ilium bone. So this is the ilio femoral, this is the femur. And the ischio, posterior, ischio femoral ligament, connecting bone to bone, dense, regular connective tissue. This is anterior view. So kind of the lesser trochanter kind of looks, is always medial. And the greater trochanter is always lateral. So that's how you could tell right and left femur or anterior posterior. Pubic symphysis, obturator foramen. This is actually posterior. We're looking at a two dimensional picture. So this is your ischial tuberosity. This is the ramus of the pubic bone. So you have the pubofemoral ligament, and then you have the iliofemoral ligament also in the front, two of them. So it's pretty simple when, once you get to know the bones. Now right now it's, it's, it's not so easy. This is a model version of what you just saw. This is anterior. So here's your pubic bone, no pubic symphysis. And this is your pubo, pubofemoral and iliofemoral, iliofemoral. Greater trochanter, lesser trochanter. The knee joint and most complex, another really bad architecture. I know it flexes and extends, but a very prone to injury. So there's a joint, well, there's two bones in the lower leg. You have the lateral fibula, not very weight bearing, thin. <clears throat> and you have your medial tibia. So you have most of the joint is formed on the, well, femur patella is a different area, but most of the joint is the femur to the tibia. So this joint, the femur and the patella is the kneecap. And the kneecap is basically suspended in a tendon called the quadriceps tendon. And the bottom of the kneecap connection to the tibia is the patella ligament because that's connecting a bone to bone. So it does have a gliding motion over the femur mostly, right? And then there's, and that's the front. So patella is in the front, right? Like you told me on the practical, patella is front and popliteal is the back. There's no popliteal bone though. It's just posterior knee, none. So you have the lateral joint. And again, it's tibial femoral, it's femoral and tibial. And then medial joint is also femoral tibial. So tibiofemoral sounds better. So the medial joints are tibiofemoral. And that's where you have the medial meniscus is medial, that little fibrocartilaginous disc. And there's a lateral meniscus as well. So most of it's flexion extension, very little rotation very little rotation, right? Especially when dynamic movement. So extension is kind of limited too. Flexion, you get a lot more range of motion, more degrees of angular motion. Uh, this is lateral view, mid sagittal, yeah, I suppose, right through the, the knee. And this would be the right knee. So we're looking at the lateral meniscus here, front. I'm sorry, back of knee, this is popliteal here. See posterior knee, patella is anterior, synovial joint. And you have a more fat pad. Here's a fat pad. I don't know if we saw that clearly until now. The fat pad, and you have bursa in the knee too, like super patellar bursa and deep infra patella bursa, flexion extension. So if you ever were a catcher in softball or baseball and as a kid, and this gets very inflamed. And look what it says. This is really important too. Like the, the patella superior has a connection to the tendon of the quadriceps, which are four anterior thigh muscles. So this is a tendon. Now below the patella, you have a connection of the patella to the tibia. And this is this is a part here called the tibial tuberosity. So the post the inferior connection of the patella to the tibia is is a ten, is a ligament. So ligament connects connects bone to bone. And this is a lateral view, so you can only see the lateral meniscus. And, his, and some more fun stuff, the synovial cavity, which is part of a 
every synovial joint. And of course the articular capsule and there's articular cartilage on the femur and the tibia. Not so much on the patella, just enough to cover the smooth um, inner surface, I guess we can call it our deep surface. Very cool. This is a superior view, looking down at the tibia, really. So the femur is not here. So this is your tibial tuberosity right here. And you have these two ligaments that crisscross, they form a cross, so that's what they call cruciate. So the anterior cruciate and the posterior cruciate, they basically perform the same function to avoid excess extension of the knee, very easily injured by ACL, right? ACL, anterior cruciate ligament, you might've heard of that, and PCL. Yeah, so this is the right leg, so this would be the medial meniscus and the lateral meniscus. Looking down at the right leg anterior is up here. <clears throat> you can see the articular cartilage of the tibia. And you'll learn that these parts of the tibia are called condyle. So what does that mean now? That's the problem. Okay, and not too much to know here. There's, wow, look at this. I don't even remember this. 12 bursa in the knee joint. Yeah, it's a, it's a very complicated, but very prone to injury, pain, and hard to treat because of the complexity of the knee. Good anterior view, so you get to know what this looks like. You can see this is the rectus femoris. This is the vastus lateralis. This is the vastus medialis. And there's a vastus intermedius, which is behind the rectus femoris. There are muscles that basically form the quadriceps. There's four muscles in the upper thigh. Here's the fibula, which is always lateral. So I know this is anterior because the patella. Tibia is medial, fibula is always lateral. And there's a ligaments on the side, and this could be called either lateral collateral ligament or fibular collateral ligament. Uh, laterally connecting the femur to the fibula. So that's the connection there to the fibula. So it has some function, this poor bone. And medially, you have the medial collateral ligament, also known as tibial collateral ligament, because the tibia is always medial to the fibula. This is the right leg looking at the anterior view. Patella ligament, quadriceps tendon. And if you said patella tendon, I'd be good with that. So when you do a reflex, like a knee jerk reflex, you hit the ligament, you hit the patella ligament, and that causes a stretch in the quadriceps and it makes you Extend your knee, bring your leg up. These are good things to know now as we're going, as we're learning. We're learning, right? We're learning. So fibular and, lat and tibial collateral ligament is the ones you should know. Again, look through your book. <clears throat> For lab, again, we don't, we're not gonna do too much of this. So we'll go through that when we get done with bones and I'll show you what you need to know. Posterior review of the knee joint, including the ligament is very complicated. Now you can see it. It has like that ace bandage wrapping, which is really the um, joint capsule. And remember the posterior, so the tibial is lateral. I'm sorry, tibial is medial. So this is the right um, knee and the fibula is lateral because we're looking posterior. So fibula collateral, which is lateral collateral, tibial collateral, which is medial collateral. Um, and don't worry about the other ligaments. You have enough to worry about. And these two we showed you. Uh, again, prevents hyperextension and posterior uh, cruciate ligament also prevents hyperextension, but also sliding forward, of course. So this is why like, you know, especially in females, <clears throat> I think females have a little bit more freedom in extension. So they have a little more hyperextension normally. So if you add to that, like playing soccer all year round on turf, you know, you're gonna do a lot of sliding and extending. And that really makes this ligament vulnerable. And it's a very commonly injured or torn ligament in soccer for females, especially, but it happens in basketball, it happens in football, happens in everything one way or another. So ligaments are basically stopping excessive motion. 
just another view of a cartoon of the knee joint. Dead guy knee joint. The anterior view, right um, knee. Here's your fibular collateral or lateral collateral ligament. You'll learn about the condyles of the femur. There's also condyles of the tibia and they form a joint with meniscus in between. So lateral meniscus, medial meniscus. And this quadriceps tendon was cut. That's why the patella is flipped forward. So the patella is not really connected to anything. It's suspended in the tendon and ligament of the quadriceps. Yeah, and you can see the anterior cruciate kind of crosses over. And there's two little peaks on the tibia called the intercondylar en eminence, which pretty much are connections for the posterior and anterior cruciate ligaments. The cruciates form like a cross right in the middle of that intercondylar fossa. So this would be a lateral condyle of femur, medial condyle of femur, lateral condyle of tibia, medial condyle of tibia, right side. <clears throat> Common knee injuries, of course, lateral collateral ligament, if you get hit inside the knee, it's, it's much more, um, the medial collateral ligament on the tibial side is much more prone to injury, especially if you get hit from the outside, like in football. So you can get tears, depend on where the injury affects. So ACL running and hyperextension really should be on here as well. So ligaments don't heal, right? Because they're avascular, dense, regular connective tissue with almost no regenerative ability. So usually you have to have that either replaced or sewn or removed sometimes. But you're not going to get it removed if you need to go on making a billion dollars playing basketball. They're going to use another type of ACL and replace it or sew it up, strengthen it. You're going to go for hours and hours of physio rehab. Hockey puck to the lateral knee. Pretty extreme, right? But you should be wearing pads. Um, medial meniscus is going to tear. When you hit from the lateral, it shifts everything towards the medial. So your medial a meniscus can tear and your medial collateral ligament or tibial collateral ligament. And you might as well throw the anterior cruciate in there too as well. So you're out for the season. Well, that's in hockey. Hockey is one of the toughest sports. This guy's probably in the next game. He's going to go in. Baseball, forget about it. He's going to retire. <clears throat> Cartilage tears, of course. Tearing. Meniscus tearing. What we just saw. Arthur arthroscopic surgery is very small incision with a camera where they can go in with lasers or machines to kind of kind of wear, uh, take away the inflammation. And if it's, if it's uh, arthritic, they could grind down the bone or actually go in and sew the tendon or replace the tendon through arthroscopic surgery. Maybe there's a picture coming up. It's kind of cool. Yeah, so this is the what the arthroscope sees. So you see the tear in the meniscus. So they can go and they clean all this out, like cut this out. And then they kind of repair the tendon or the uh, meniscus or ligament, whatever it is, and then see if it could heal. Sometimes without physical therapy, depending on the degree of the injury. So this is an arthroscopic um, view and a photograph of that. You can never tell what this is unless you knew, though, right? Because this is bone. Here's the fibrocartilage, and here's the bottom part bone, which is the tibia. It's distal. Sprains, like I said, really have more to do with ligaments. Like strains is more muscle, but sprains has to do with the ligament, the joint capsule, the joint fluid, and the joint cavity. And of course, this takes longer to heal than a strain. A strain usually involves a muscle injury. Sprain involves the synovial joint itself and all the parts. So it depends what happens or how bad the sprain is, of course, like the rolling of your ankle hyperextension of the knee. So of course, rice, right? Rest, ice, compression, elevation. Sometimes you had to pee for protection. Just in time, really, this is, this about says it all. Allow time and rice at first. Dislocation is when a bone falls out of its alignment, <clears throat> but you, this is usually accompanied by soft tissue injuries like sprains and strains and excess inflammation. 
And of course, you can't move the joint without severe pain. Yep, must be reduced. Uh, this a subluxation is a partial dislocation. Like sometimes they just call it luxation. Luxation is still a little bit less than a dislocation. Subluxation is a minor dislocation. Luxation is kind of in between. Inflammation of a bursa, bursitis. Kind of get very thick, inflamed. And there's your rice, all right? Rest, ice, compression, elevation. Sometimes you need to use Advil, <clears throat> ibuprofen, or naproxen, or hopefully not stronger anti-inflammatories like cortisone, like injections or oral cortisone to decrease the, the response to too many macrophages and too much fluid being produced in a faulty or injured joint. Tendonitis is inflammation of a tendon. So th this can happen in a lot of different tendons, in the shoulder, in the hip, in the elbow, like tennis elbow. Um, in the tendonitis of the foot, very common. So yeah, the, the symptoms are treated, but treated similar, but I think it depends on the degree, but tendonitis seems to heal a little bit easier than bursitis. And they all could be part of a sprain too. But usually this is overuse, tendonitis or misuse. Same thing with bursitis. Arthritis uh, generally means inflammation in the joints. Arthro means joint, itis refers to inflammation. So there's many different types of arthritis. That's a lot greater than 100, okay? If you classified all of them, but it's all about inflammation. But it depends on the, really it depends on the cause. So like you have degenerative arthritis, everybody might have that as you get older, as you, your joint capsules and joint, and, and joint capsules will get a little harder and less flexible. Your articular cartilage starts to erode and the bones get a little thicker and you lose movement. Inflammatory though could be something in the blood like rheumatoid, which is an autoimmune inflammatory disease. So really that's the main difference. Right, some can be caused by microorganisms as well, but usually you're going to have an osteomyelitis, which is a bone infection when that happens. So, all the inflammatory symptoms with pain, stiffness, and swelling, right? So, osteoarthritis is the degenerative form, not from the blood. There's no autoimmune condition, this is wear and tear of any joint, especially synovial joints. Rheumatoid arthritis is a problem in the blood where your, uh, your lymphocytes, T cells, are attacking your own joints and they start to deform and get red and swollen and painful. And this can jump from joint to joint. Rheumatoid arthritis is bloodborne and autoimmune. It's about the white blood cells. Something like gouty arthritis. Um, Gout is a condition where you have very high levels of what's called uric acid, which are crystals that kind of settle in your joints. Usually it's from people who can't metabolize um, nucleic acids or you know, eat a lot of red meat maybe. And there's a lot of those nucleic acids in that blood or, or it could be genetic. So the arthritis comes from a metabolic problem. So this is, this is more metabolic. Arthritis, breakdown of, of proteins, breakdown of uric acid, of nucleic acids. Rheumatoid arthritis is more to do with the blood and the white blood cells. So this is autoimmune. Like psoriatic arthritis would fall into an autoimmune condition. Psori psoriasis can lead to an arthritis. But osteoarthritis is just degenerative, common. Wear and tear. Aging, yeah, it's, I mean, you can prevent it, but it, 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 you know, if you live to 115 and you don't have osteoarthritis, you're going into a museum. Because sooner or later, if people are living longer, they're gonna suffer more from osteoarthritis because the bones are not gonna outlive their bodies overall or the joints, I should say, wear and tear over time. You know, so that's the most common. <clears throat> so 
so you know you have enzymes naturally breaking down the cartilage and of course the collagen is is not replaced as well and it's it's weaker and you get like these little spikes called osteophytes or bone spurs and that could really affect the tendons that are coming through them by 85 85 half americans half of americans develop osteoarthritis more in women than men i could argue all these things I know 85 year olds that don't have hardly any osteoarthritis. That's rare though, that's rare. So most, normal part of aging, right? Treatment, um, activity I think is the best one here. The more you sit with osteoarthritis, the more pain you're gonna be in. You know, so it doesn't make sense to take any pain relievers unless you really can't get on with your life. Capsaicin cream is, is like what they have at hot peppers, you know, when you you need jalapenos, the hot stuff comes from a chemical called capsaicin. So that tends to work with relieving, and it's a topical cream that actually, natural, that could actually make you feel better. And you could take these things that are all building blocks for cartilage, um, but there's no real um, research on this that says it really works. So this was a fad about 20 years ago. It started glucosamine chondroitin, MSM, so, I mean, it makes sense, but I don't, it's not going to get rid of the, the pain. And that noisy stuff you feel, like, like what grandpa feels, what Fenizio feels when he gets out of a chair, that cracking sound in your knees and popping, it's all called crepitus. That sounds really disgusting. You got to change that name. Crepitus sounds disgusting. Chick-fil-A, number one. Crispy chicken sandwich, Valerie. Rheumatoid is an autoimmune disease. And we really don't know what starts this. It can be genetic though. It can, usually in women. And these, you know, postmenopausal too. Not all the time, not all the time, but that, that's a big part of it. So I don't know if hormonal changes have anything to do with it. A lot of swelling. This is really a hot joints. They really get, have problems and weakness of the bones and uh, loss of density, osteoporosis. The muscles even seem to get affected. Not only are they weaker, but they start to degenerate a bit. And rheumatoid, the factor, rheumatoid factor is a cell that was discovered as uh, part of your immune system actually can affect your heart. You get a rheumatic heart, which you'll learn in AP2. So how do we treat it? You know, That's the thing. Usually it's a lot of uh, anti-inflammatories. So different names here that are kind of giving you synovitis is inflammation of the synovial membrane. Um, sometimes the, and this is a kind of a, a hallmark sign, really, and it's like a, a big piece of um, cartilage that's kind of within your joints. And that's called a panis. It's so big, you can see it on x-ray. And then as the joints are eroding, they're, they're basically getting destroyed, like like little mice have bit some of the bone away in rheumatoid. It's a horrible condition if you know anybody that has it. And sometimes the bones just fuse, and that's called ankylosis, is fusion of, of the joint. Really, the joint disappears completely, and the, the bones become fused where they should have had movement. So completely immobilizing. Fingers get, get affected, necks. Uh, fingers, especially though, in women for some reason, autoimmune. So you could try non steroids like ibuprofen and naproxen, but it's not going to work. It may be temporary relief at best. But these steroids have such horrible side effects. So, probably the best route, but again, more side effects, is suppressing the immune, uh, immune system by giving immune, immunosuppressants which will stop the attack. But of course, you're more likely to get sick if you're suppressing your immune system. Yeah, it's kind of like cancer. Right? That's why they say tumor necrosis, to block the action of the inflammatory chemicals. So it's, and this is why they use immune suppressants for the immune system, uh, for cancer as a form of therapy. And sometimes the, the joint has to be completely replaced, like if it happens in the hip, which is also very common. They could have to do a total hip replacement, and at least 
give the patient some mobility back, especially if, they're, if their age is, is young. So this is a crippling disease of deformity in these synovial joints. You get panis forming huge joints. Sometimes they just fuse to disfigurement in the hands. Very sad. And, it, and it's painful on top of it. So gouty arthritis comes from that condition called gout. Uh, depends on the foods you eat that are high in purines, like which are nucleic acids, the bigger nucleic acids. So the, the byproduct is really uric acid in your blood. And this gives you that condition called gout. For some reason, it affects the big toe, the hallux, the metacarpal phalangeal joint of the hallux, both the toes. Very painful. Like people would have severe pain in their toe. They have no idea why. They didn't hurt it. They didn't walk excessively. It's just a gout deposit. <clears throat> Maybe genetic, but also dehydration, uh, avoidance of like the, the, the liquors that are high in like the, the brown liquors, really like scotch and whiskey and all that. And the foods high in purines like red meats, steaks, and rich foods like liver and other organ meats and sardines high in those nucleic acids and elevate your uric acid level. So that can be treated metabolically by decreasing your uric acid levels. If, if there's a reason, of course, avoid the possible causative agents. But if you're prone to gout, you're gonna get high uric acid pretty easily. So there are medications always with a side effect though. Lyme disease is that it's a bacteria um, caused by a tick bite, right? And it's really a, it causes like a diffuse um, arthritic pain in multiple joints. So this takes really long to go away. Like you're on antibiotics for six months sometimes after something like Lyme disease from a tick. It's a bacteria though, Borrelia burgdorferi. Lyme is, is where they discovered it in Connecticut, Lyme, Connecticut. So it has, it has some cognitive changes too. So it does get into the blood brain barrier Lyme disease and affects your cerebrospinal fluid flow actually. And that's a major problem that has to be treated usually with surgery because you can't get antibiotics into the brain. So that's a real problem. So be careful of ticks, keep them off your dog, keep them off of you. Because who knows where this, it doesn't, you don't have to be in Connecticut to get this. In Morris County, probably someplace you really gotta be careful of all the deer because it's usually deer ticks. I'm telling you, man. So I don't care about the, um, I do, but I'm not going to go into the joint um, growth of the joint, the prenatal joint. Welcome to muscle tissue. So again, this is one of the muscle tissue, um, one of the tissue types, the major basic tissue types. And mostly we're going to be talking about skeletal muscle. And skeletal muscle is voluntary. Okay. Somebody has a question? I have to go to the chat and then I'm recording right now, but I'll check it out. No problem. Don't worry. Okay. So <clears throat> voluntary, what does that mean? This means I could use my cerebral cortex, which is the outer portion of my cerebrum, to start a contraction. Right? This is not automatic. It's voluntary. Like moving a pencil, kicking a football, hitting a golf ball. It all starts with a voluntary thought from the brain, from the cerebral part of the brain, the part where we have cognition, the part where we have volition or voluntary ability to make a decision to move a muscle. So again, voluntary is a big deal about it. Okay, so you have the types of muscle tissue. We'll go through those as well. And look at this fact here. Nearly half of the body's mass is muscle tissue, but it's all three different types. So we're gonna need energy to contract the muscle because let's face it, the only thing a muscle does is contract. 
and it needs energy to do that. And it needs a nervous impulse, whether it's from our brains, like I said, the um, cerebral cortex, or it's even an involuntary muscle like cardiac or smooth muscle. So the types are skeletal, voluntary, and then there's smooth, and then there is cardiac. Excuse me one second, I'm hearing some background noise. Let me just pause this. So yeah, the three types, skeletal, voluntary, and then you have your smooth, which is smooth is really your blood vessels and your digestive tubes and respiratory tubes. Cardiac is your heart muscle, involuntary. But most, most of the time we're gonna live in the skeletal. Cardiac and, and skeletal muscle also striated. Smooth is not so striated, not striated. So again, skeletal muscle, voluntary, striated. And there's a whole bunch of other things that are important. So no, voluntary, involuntary, involuntary, skeletal muscle striated, cardiac muscle striated. Okay, we'll look at some of those fibers. We saw them in the tissue lab as well. So skeletal muscle tissue moves bones, moves joints. And they're striated and they're voluntary because they're controlled by our cerebral cortex, the outer portion of our cerebrum, where we have not only volition, but cognition of what we feel as well. But we're talking about motor. And that's kind of important because you have to know that a skeletal muscle needs a neuron. A neuron is a nerve cell. When it starts, there's neurons in the brain, there's neurons in the spinal cord, and there's neurons in the nerves that lead to the skeletal muscles, all the muscles that you'll learn, like the pectoralis major, the gluteus maximus, and the quadriceps. So they need a neuron and they need a motor neuron to, for the impulse. So it starts in the brain consciously controlled. They use ATP and oxygen. So to make, of course, to make ATP, you need oxygen. So first of all, you need a good supply of oxygen. So skeletal muscles actually store oxygen in what's called myoglobin. And heart muscle has this as well, because a heart muscle really relies on oxygen. And what do we need the oxygen for? You need oxygen to make ATP, which is cellular energy. Your muscles can't contract if they don't have ATP and they can't detach either. So ATP is a big part of muscle contraction or muscle function. And then you need to, the nutrients to give you the ability to make ATP, the fuel for ATP. And one, the one we really want to use, the macromolecule we really want to use for energy. Anybody know? Is it carbohydrate? Is it protein? Is it nucleic acid? Or is it lipid? What's the, what's the primary energy source in our body? Anyone? Anybody awake? Carbohydrate? Yeah, carbohydrate. Like in the monosaccharide, very good, is glucose. I mean, we could use the rest of those micromolecules. Like you could use fatty acids to make ATP, but we want to use primarily glucose, which is carbohydrate, but it's carbon, of course, hydrogen and oxygen. And we're going to split that in a place called, what's the powerhouse of the cell? Where are we making the, most of the, the mitochondria, right? So skeletal muscle have a lot of mitochondria. They have a lot of myoglobin, very vascular blood supply. Really important. And you're going to hear another thing. For muscle contraction, of course you need sodium and potassium 
for depolarization and repolarization of the membrane, but you also need calcium. Calcium, really important for muscle contraction. So you need all of these parts, all these parts. And you can hear something called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. which is totally different in a muscle cell. So they call this the SR. And this, and sarco, you're gonna see again, sarco, that prefix refers to muscle, muscle. So like the membrane of a muscle is called a sarcolemma. The cytoplasm inside the cell is called the sarcoplasm. Sarco, muscle, muscle, muscle. So all these things you need is you know, calcium, oxygen, ATP, myoglobin. And, and also you're going to see they're multinucleated. And the funny thing is they're amitotic. They don't even undergo mitosis in a, in a full grown muscle system. So the nucleus is all about building proteins, which are structure, right? Proteins are structure. Carbohydrates more for your energy, lipids, storing energy, making steroids and phospholipids. So we need to know about proteins and you're going to hear terms like actin and myosin, which are contractile proteins within the muscle cell some of the smallest parts of a muscle cell. So just throwing these words at you. So when you hear him again, it says, okay, muscle, yeah, sarco. He said, I need, we need calcium. Why do we study all that calcium homeostasis and those hormones? Well, it's for nerve conduction and muscle contraction. So you need the neuron, of course, the motor neuron to activate the contraction. You need oxygen, you need ATP. ATP needs a source many mitochondria, many nucleus, multinucleated, storage of oxygen and myoglobin, hopefully getting good amount of glucose. So we store glucose in the, in the skeletal muscle. We store glucose in skeletal muscle, a little bit in cardiac muscle and liver. And the storage form of glucose is called glycogen. So when we need glucose to make ATP, it's, it's right there in the skeletal muscle. So glycogen is stored in the liver and skeletal muscle mostly. Stored glucose as glycogen. Glycogen is the polysaccharide, which is branches and branches of glucose stored in our liver and our <clears throat> skeletal muscles. And the bigger the muscle, the more of all these things. And the, and the more mitochondria you have, the more my, myoglobin, the more vascularity, blood flow, the less fatigable a muscle will be. Like if you go to Popeye's, right? Think about this. Let's talk about this now. I mean, I don't wanna bore you with the same nuts and bolts. So let's talk about this, right? You go to Popeye's, right? And you order one breast and the thigh. Which one is the darker of those two? The thigh. Mm -hmm. And the thigh is part of the leg, right? That's the upper part of the chicken leg. So the, the breast is basically controlling the wings. And as far as I know, maybe not just the at Popeyes, but chickens don't really fly. Is that correct? Correct. They're, out, they're, more, they're more likely running around. So what's going to be less fatigable, their thighs or their breasts? They need more energy for their thighs, right? And it, it's darker because you have so much blood flow. You have so much mitochondria. You have so much myoglobin in that area in the, of the thighs. The breasts, Is that why are, the breasts are like super dry. <laughs> They shouldn't be. You got to learn how to cook it, Natalia. That's the whole thing. No, but like I on it, like if we go to Popeyes or wherever, I don't like getting like the breast because it's like drier than the. That, that's very good. That's very true. Yeah, that's very true, and that's why um, 
it's less, it's, it's more, again, I don't want to get too ahead of this, but it's, it's thicker uh, protein fibers more. And the breasts are more for like quick movements, like, you know, lifting weights. Like if the, if, if the chicken went to the, uh, what, what's the gym, like Planet Fitness down the block from Popeye's, they use their breast to do more bench pressing. Like the chicken would have to use their wings to bench press. Low reps, right? Low reps. So the tissue, the muscle tissue is, is whiter. It's less aerobic. Whereas the thigh, the chicken's going to probably go on the treadmill or the, um, you know, what's the other thing called? We, we do the, uh, not the stair thing, but what do you call those? The, the aerobic ellipt- machine. What is it called? The elliptical. Maybe elliptical. Yeah. Like the chicken go on the elliptical and use it, its legs more. So it, it, it's less fatigable. So it's darker meat because it has more myoglobin, more mitochondria, which is darker, more blood flow. So that's a, that's a big concept that it's important for the constituents of skeletal muscle, just the, the fiber type, let alone all this contraction stuff. Because they're all going to contract because that's all that muscle does, right? Skeletal muscle, especially. Cardiac muscle is very specialized. Of course, it's involuntary and voluntarily controlled. And it's, it's striated, right? So it has actin and myosin, and it needs all the same stuff. It needs calcium, it needs a ton of oxygen, and it needs to make a ton of ATP. Because remember, I might have said this, the skeletal muscle you could use, we could run, the chicken goes on the elliptical, you use all that ATP, you use all that glucose, you use all that oxygen, but then you could pay it back. You could pay the quadriceps back, you know, like using a credit card, you buy now and you pay later. But cardiac muscle, this thing starts beating before you're born, you're barely an embryo, barely a fetus, and it's got to beat every minute, whatever the heart rate is, it's a little slower as you, you're born, 75 beats per minute for their whole life. There's no um, credit card here. This is cash, cash only. So you really need to keep that ATP flowing, the calcium flowing, actin and myosin working. So again, we're not going to go too far into cardiac muscle except what it looks like and how it's different um, structurally and visually. And it also has, it doesn't have as many nuclei. Smooth muscle is really important. We really don't talk a lot about smooth muscle in AMP1, but really important. This is, it doesn't rely so much on oxygen though. This is your blood vessels, like walls of your hollow organ. That's what you guys answered a lot when you saw that. As long as you didn't um, you know, confuse it with dense, regular connective tissue, which is really easy to do. And not, not a lot of you did that. That's really a, a completely understandable mistake because it looks so much like that. So the walls of the stomach, which churn food, need muscle contraction to do so. And that's smooth muscle. So I, li- I like to call smooth muscle also visceral muscle. Involuntary, of course. The urinary bladder, you guys were great with the transitional epithelium, but there's also smooth muscle in the bladder and airways, your bronchioles of your respiratory system. So we're not gonna talk about any of this stuff this semester. We're just gonna talk about skeletal muscle and neuro from here on out, right? So let's find out about these and, and really get to know skeletal muscle as best you can, okay? And this is doesn't have that striated look. So it's not that conforming actin and myosin striation looking. So yeah, involuntary cannot be controlled voluntarily. Visceral, non-striated, involuntary. Should be a good table coming up soon. So here's the histology, <clears throat> which you should know very well. If, if you don't already, you know, the intercalated discs give away the heart muscle. Skeletal muscle is much more linear striated and the it's multinucleated and the nuclei is these dark stating parts, you know, and they're on the periphery where uh, cardiac muscle, they're more in the central part of the cell and cardiac muscle is more both branched or branched, y'all. Smooth muscle, you don't see that. Spindle shaped nuclei 
kind of uniform with no striations. So single nucleated. And I guarantee if you're a nurse, you're gonna see this on an NCLEX. So you always have to remember this. Uh, like I can tell you many of those things because I do the classes for NCLEX review. I'll tell you exactly what's on these tests. So I make a big deal out of it, especially for the nurses, but if everybody. Okay, so the characteristics of all muscle tissue, this is still all muscle tissue, but I'm gonna to lean towards skeletal, the voluntary type. So they're excitable. And this is about their membrane. The membrane, cellular membrane of a muscle cell is called sarcolemma. And it has contractibility because that's what it does. And the proteins are sliding across each other like actin and myosin. Let's hear these names over and over. You'll never forget it. And they have the ability to, to stretch. I mean, there's not many elastic fibers, but muscles are a very unique tissue, obviously, just like neuro, nerve tissue. So it could stretch without really tearing unless, of course, it goes to extreme. And once it is stretched, it could go back to its normal resting length. And that's really important because you need an optimal length, especially between actin and myosin, because that's what you're doing. Like actin and myosin, why not talk about it now? Like actin, you're gonna see is a very thin filament protein that kind of looks like, like this, like, like beads kind of lining up like this. Actin is a light and thin compared to myosin, which is thicker and darker. So myosin is the dark fiber. And it kind of looks, it kind of looks like a golf club. You know, we have the shaft of the golf club and the head of the golf club like this. So myosin is dark. Some books, I don't know what Pearson does, but I think it tends to be red or blue. <clears throat> so Myosin is the thick one. So this is myosin. The BD one is actin. So at rest, these should look, or they should be at an optimal distance to each other. So, so at rest, the muscle is relaxed, right? And then if you stretch it, the actin is going to go this way and the myosin is going to go that way. So that kind of makes it harder to get a muscle contraction because you don't have this connection or the ability to have that connection. So when, and you're gonna learn about this, when myosin binds to actin, it's gonna swing the actin this way. So the myosin is gonna fling the actin across to the middle of this specific part of the cell. So that's elasticity and, and extensibility is really important. The integrity of these proteins are really important. And that's why you have so much nuclei because in ribosomes, because you're trying, you're always building proteins inside a muscle. They're not going to go in mitosis. So you don't get excess when you work out and you build like when the chicken goes and pumps iron, he's doing bicep curls with his wings. He's not adding a number of muscles to his bicep brachii complex. He's just making them bigger, which is hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is in growth and size, where hyperplasia is excess growth of cells. So muscles don't undergo hyperplasia normally. That would be a tumor. Muscles, skeletal muscles, are all muscles undergo what's called hypertrophy. And heart muscles can do this too. But mostly skeletal muscles are much more reactive to resistance stress. The heart doesn't like resistance. And hypertrophy in the heart is not a good thing. So the functions, movement, right? You told me this, you know, moving. The heart pumps the blood, the cardiac muscle, I should say. Digesting, smooth muscle helps with digestion, like eating my burrito, right? And walking, movement, locomoting your joints, moving your femur, moving your tibia and fibula at the same time. Marching, all postural muscles as well are all skeletal muscles, body position, skeletal muscles. Stabilizing joints, skeletal muscles. Generating heat as they contract, skeletal muscle. So everything pretty much besides these is a function of skeletal muscle. And it, it provides protection too. 
So they generate heat when you shiver, right? So every time a muscle contracts, like when you go through the whole contraction of, you know, using glucose to make ATP and then calcium entering the cell or going towards the proteins. And then when the actin and myosin slide over each other, that is going to generate heat as a byproduct. So it's not just shivering. It happens every time a muscle contracts. And this is what helps maintain your body temperature at homeostatic levels, 98.6 or 37 uh, Fahrenheit or 37 degrees centigrade or Celsius. Yeah, so you need a lot of these things. We, we kind of talked about tendon sheaths, um, <clears throat> connective, and the sheaths are made of connective tissue that hold the tendons together. And you need innervation. Everything, even the heart needs innervation. It has its own, but skeletal muscles need innervation. Smooth muscle use innervation as well. And you need vascularity, blood supply. Because where are we gonna get the oxygen from? Where are we gonna get the glucose from? Where are we gonna get the insulin it helps bring glucose into the cell if we need it. And we have to break down glycogen as well. So we need enzymes to do that. Yep, and the attachments, of course, uh, what attaches a muscle to a bone is a tendon. What attaches a bone to a bone is a ligament. But in between muscles, you have compacting or packaging muscles. And besides tendons and a kind of a um, continuation of tendons is tissue that starts out as dense regular and then goes into dense irregular connective tissue, and that's called fascia, which connects muscle to muscle. You're also going to see that's also called aponeurosis. Yeah. So I think we get this, right? We need nervous system input to skeletal muscle for sure. You need blood supply to skeletal muscle for sure. Where are you gonna get the calcium from, right? Where are you gonna get the oxygen from the red blood cells in the blood? Conscious means we're using our cerebral cortex. The cerebrum is our higher brain centers. And the cortex is gray matter on the outer portion, like cortex means outer, like bark, like bark of a tree, not like bark of a dog. So this controls every contraction of skeletal muscle. Huge amount of oxygen, huge amount of glucose to make ATP, huge amount of amino acids to build proteins. And of course, you have to get rid of the waste products. What's a waste product? Big waste product is carbon dioxide. Every time you use oxygen, you gotta get rid of that carbon dioxide through cellular respiration. And another one could be lactic acid. And that's a byproduct of anaerobic respiration where we don't use oxygen for muscle contraction. And you'll learn all that at the end of this chapter, when we talk about cellular respiration, how we actually make the ATP with and without the use of oxygen. And of course you're making boatloads of ATP with oxygen, aerobic in the mitochondria. So the byproduct of aerobic respiration is carbon dioxide. The byproduct of anaerobic respiration is lactic acid. So this is a byproduct of, and of course, O2 in carbon dioxide out. This is glucose in lactic acid out. So when the chicken goes to the gym, right? He's using more of this for his breasts. His, well, I should say breasts, I should say the pectoralis major. What am I talking about here? That's the breast muscle. So that's like doing low reps, more power. He's bench pressing. Right, so the byproduct would be lactic acid. You don't make a lot of ATP, so you don't get a lot of time for bench press as far as fatigability. But over here, he's used, what'd you say, Natalia? The elliptical. 
Yeah, that's what I said. Is that a Y here? I don't even know. So the elliptical is more aerobic, right? Respiration, aerobic exercise. So here he's working his thighs. I'm not gonna write thighs, what's wrong with me? I, I, I won't go too deep, but I'll just say quadriceps muscle. Right? So he can't fly anyway, so he's not using his, his, his wings and his pectoralis major to fly like most birds do. So by the time he gets back to Popeyes and I show up, I choose the dark meat if I want the tender meat, like Natalia said, darker meat, darker. So there's gonna be more myoglobin, more mitochondria because you're getting all this oxygen and all this ATP and it's less fatigable. And then he's gonna, we're gonna use his pecs for the breasts and they're gonna be whiter meat, less mitochondria, more powerful, but maybe, like she says, maybe a little drier. Who knows? It's not all about eating because we got to talk about the human. And I'm, I'm not relating that to Popeyes anymore. So the different types of tissue. Whew, this is kind of boring. Um, when we talk about the connective tissue sheath. So I'm not going to do that to you right now. And we're going to start next time on this connective tissue sheath. So I actually put a... Um, <clears throat> 